Welcome to the wide world of punting where we talk about anything and everything in the world of punting. I'm Jacob Wynn. This is episode 15, the second last episode of the season. Maybe the second last episode ever. That's really up to you guys. Got another massive one. First of all, an interview with Jake Humphreys in depth. He's our tennis guy. The Australian Open starts up next week. Then I'm giving my own punting life lessons, a little monologue. This is in response to the Ask Winnie Anything. I've actually given a question about what I would advise my younger self. It's own little segment. Hopefully there's some stuff you guys can get out of that on your own punting journeys. Got Jamie Soward come in to talk NBA. Got some cameo Super Bowl prop bets. Of course, the Super Bowl it starts next week on Monday as well, Australian time. And then Tristan comes in for behind bookie lines and he talks about the life of a CEO of being a CEO of a bookmaker as well as Super Bowl betting in general from his perspective. And then I bring it home with the Why Well Bet of the Week. Let's begin with the chat with Jake Humphreys. Your second time on the show because Alex interviewed you all the way back in episode three, and we are right. now Wild World of Punting episode fifteen. Wow. Um, so if people are interested in the, uh, your chat with Alex, if they enjoy this chat, they may want to go back and listen to that one because I'm going to touch on a couple of those same topics which I found really interesting. But I, you know, we're not going to repeat the whole thing. But certainly in your chat with Alex, you talked a lot about um, success that you've had with your futures bets, whether you be riding home some really juicy priced winners or cashing out after a significant odds shift. And you talked to Alex about your strategy when you ride it, when you just cash out, right? But what I've heard you talk about a lot is when you talk about your futures plays, you say, these are higher than what I make the odds. So my question is, mm. can you actually go into detail of how you make your own odds for tournaments? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, you, you gotta, you've got to wait for the draw to release, which usually comes out sometimes I mean, it's about one or two days before a tournament starts. Um, and from that point onwards, you start to figure out who's playing who's playing in what quarter, who's playing at you know, the top or bottom half of the draw, and basically start to have a look at a person's player path to start with. So that's what I like to do. So, you know, if I've got somebody wedged in the top quarter in between, you know, a one and an eight seed or something like that, I need to look at who they're going to have to bump into if they want to win the competition. Um, so that's something that's really important, like player path and where someone's positioned in the draw itself. Um, there's like... There's so many different factors that go into it that I that I mentioned on the in the first discussion um, with Alex, but it kind of comes down to sh- like strength of schedule, player path, and another thing that's really important. I've got something down here in my notes that I wanted to make sure I mention was that did I do I think if there's a selected player that I that I like or I think is over the odds, it's usually because I am selling a short price individual in that quarter because. What happens is um, people often ask me, why do you bet the futures prices before the tournament starts? Because they take so much percentage out of the market, like 20 or 30% or whatever. Why do you do that when you could potentially just roll over head-to-head bets on an individual? And the reason why I don't do that is because more often than not, a key man from that quarter or that part of the draw will get eliminated. A lot of the time, the ones and two seeds, especially at the ATP 250, 500 tournaments where I've had most of my success, don't have the necessary motivation to be priced up as short as they are. And you can get guys who um, are just value. And another thing that's important as well is I like to, if I've got somebody at $17 in a quarter um, and I've got some, and I've got like the favorite of that quarter at $5 to win the tournament, I match those two up together. And would there be that much of a discrepancy between the price if they were in a head to head scenario? That's something I like to do as well. And, And oftentimes it, do, it doesn't match up. You've got a guy, a couple of guys who one guy would be $1.50 and one guy would be $2.50 in a head-to-head scenario. But on the outright scheme of things, one guy's 5 bucks and one guy's $17. I just think that there's like a bunch of different little weaknesses and maybe factors that aren't taken into consideration by the odds makers. Seeding is something odds makers overlook a lot of the time. Like something as simple as if you're a one to eight seed at a 250 tournament, um, you get a you get a round off. Yeah, you know, I understand there'd be heaps of elements that go into it, and I understand I appreciate that. So if you're looking at someone who's paying twenty to one to win the tournament, and people will say if you bet them every single round, each round you can pick the bookie that's got the best price. You can you know there's advantages, there's reasons to do it, and then they might hit a certain matchup. You don't like them as much, you don't have to roll it all in. But I appreciate what you're saying that if you're kind of foreseeing possibly that a section of the draw could open up for them, you might not get those pre-tournament odds, even if you do multi it through. But I'm really uh, yeah. fascinated by this process, right, though. So, But still, when, when you see someone that's priced at 
twelve dollars to win a tournament, and you say, "I have them at eight. Like, I kind of get what you're saying. Are you basically saying that you project what? Let's say they're going to have to win four or five rounds to win the tournament. Yeah, you're projecting basically what their odds would be each of those five matches to then make yeah. your number eight dollars. Yeah, but the, the thing is, there's so many different scenarios in each of those five matches because there's yes, so many exactly. different people to come from one side of the draw. Right. So what I am, what I do at the start of every season, or I've done for the last, I think, three seasons now, is I've got a spreadsheet together and I have, I have updated odds, which I probably update them like once every one or two months. Every single player in the top 100 against each other, what my odds are. Right. Does that make sense? So yes, I've got, yes. If I, and if it, I, that essentially equates to a percentage probability that if they were to meet... I yeah. suppose you'd have to adjust it based on surface. Oh, yeah, um, I do. Heaps, but, yeah, heaps. but, yeah, and the probabilities, and obviously, like, for a player to win a tournament, their, their probability is going to have to come through in the head-to-head every single round, and then you can work out at the end what the probability is that they're victorious and equate yeah. that back to odds. Yeah, it, it's just, it is, it is hard. that Like, when you meant, just reverting back to you mentioning somebody is a 20-to-1 20, 20 shot to win a tournament, they're a 20-to-1 shot while the guy while the six or seven guys who are shorter than them are still alive Mm -hmm. but as soon as one of those guys gets knocked out and that 20 to 1 shot wins one match they could reopen at eight dollars or seven dollars depending on who's actually been knocked out but yeah like i do have a projection for every match that the person is likely to to find themselves in and then i've got you know usually specific but at the very least a rough set of odds as to what i think that match will be against that particular individual and you know you kind of land yourself somewhere around finding out well you know, he's probably a pinch over the odds. We can probably have a go at that. But then obviously the, the greater perceived edge, the larger stake there is. And that's just how it works. So if I had somebody marked it at 12, sorry, if I had somebody marked at eight and I saw them at 12, that's a pretty substantial edge that it ended up end up being a, a fair, fairly sizable chunk. But I've had other ones where I've had guys, I think I said to Alex, I had a guy, I think I had a guy marked at, at, at 12 or 13 and he was 41. Then going, all right, well, make sure everybody gets on this because... It, it, the probability doesn't really match up with what the numbers that I'm saying. So. You talk about a spreadsheet then. Do you, you ever do like any type of uh, like a Monte Carlo simulation where you would like basically build in, you, I reckon you could, I don't know how like how mathematical you go, but if you know the probabilities, because basically what it is, or you, are you familiar with that kind of process? So I, what I, like I'm actually not, I'm not a math, like I'm not a maths guy by trade. Like I'm a journo by trade. I'm an English guy by trade. And I've only gravitated towards numbers for betting, <laughs> which is probably the most degenerate thing you'll ever, I've only decided to get good at, I've only decided to get good at <laughs> mathematics once I come across betting. But so to answer your question, when you, you actually lost me at simulation, I wouldn't be sure how to do something like that. It's something that I literally write up manually on a piece of paper or type in. I, I, sometimes I, I, I draw my own little draws and just project who's going up against each other, what the odds would be. But as far as like an automated sort of, I don't know what you're talk, talking about. Right. But I, I'd love to get into something like that. I, I, ju- I just need to be pushed in the right direction. It's because it can't be done in one equation because there's so many variables. But yeah. basically you would set up all the matches and you'd input your probability for each match. And then basically the spreadsheet would do like a random number generate that would pro- basically progress each person at the percentage that you had them to win. And it would basically like you could run the whole tournament and you could run it 10,000 times and then see what weight uh, each each player had that they ended up winning the tournament. But what you basically do is, from what I'm hearing, you key in on one player. You say, what would what's my probability they advance the first round? Then when you get to the second round, it would almost be like, a two-part equation, like what's the probability that they'd beat player A and then what's or what's the probability that they'd beat player B depending on who they played in the second round. And then you'd also weight into that. What's the probability that it would be against player A versus yeah. player B, right? But, when you get like three or four rounds into it, that that's the part I'm still trying to understand how you get a precise number. Like like you're trying to project what odds they'd be in a semi-final, but there's a range of opponents they could play. So do you have to be like, all right, the toughest opponent they could meet in the semi would be this player. They'd be an underdog, but I give this player only a 30% chance of getting that far. Is that how the, you're doing the, it? I judge every player. I judge a player that I'm on, on every point, on every game, on every match, on every change of ends, on every, do I think they're going to recover on every schedule release. So it's something that's adjusted after every match. It might change based on what I've had pre-tournament. So it's literally changing all the time. Like, yeah, I have odds that I, 
or that I ha- that I have just set sitting there. But once these guys enter into the tournament and start playing a certain way and doing certain things and adapting to the surface, whatever it may be, it can change any number of ways. However, in order to make a futures bet before a tournament, I can't fall back on, yeah, I've got a model, or yeah, I'm really good at maths, or yeah, this is the percentage probability. I actually can't fall back on that. It's so largely predicated on a gut feeling in terms of these futures. At some point, I do arrive on the actual edge, how far ahead of the market I think I am. But a lot of the time, you're just like, mate, a guy, I've marked a guy at $10 and he's $26. Like, I just think, hey, look, We've got, a, we've got an edge here. Let's figure out how big the edge is. And then I just kind of go from there. So it's... Yeah, like not every handicapper can put an exact percentage probability. And this is my exact edge. And I definitely appreciate that it is an art and a science. And uh, it's not yeah, saying yeah, you're yeah. not trying to like catch you out. I was just really interested. So I was throwing a few follow-up questions. So basically, you're kind of more so saying, I've got this guy in that sort of range. And 100%. then it's like... Then it's 100%. like a, a margin, you know, because, yeah, because you obviously there's so many factors. And and when I hear people say, I've got it at this, it makes me think maybe you do have like a mathematical model and stuff. And totally that's, fair that's why as I well. Curious. I actually don't look at a player and think my calculations have him exactly $8. It's like, as yeah, as you were saying, it's yeah, like, look, in that range. He's a, he, he is a fair hunk above what he really should be. Let's figure out how big the discrepancy is. In the lead up to a tournament, when I know there's a, a set of futures about to be released, I'm on my phone refreshing like a sickening amount. It's so bad, man. I'm just like, oh, oh, oh. Like, who's got, Mar- who's got Murray River? Who's got Great Ocean Road? Who's got Antalya? Who's got this? Who's got that? And usually there's a select few bookies who release it early, sort of on their own. And usually they're the ones who are most off the mark. The people who are releasing them late are normally somewhere around the money. But there is a lot of variance. And I do cross-check it a lot of the time. So another thing that you spoke about, which really resonated with me when you chatted to Alex, was you pinpoint players on the tour at certain stages, certain locations, where you foresee them being highly motivated to get there, to be there and to get results. And conversely, you also look out for players who you think may be less motivated, may be less excited. And you gave an example of a tournament in Kazakhstan and you know high-profile players at smaller tournaments that sometimes just aren't as hungry yeah. as the lower ranked counterparts. But we are previewing the Australian Open here, you know, obviously being a grand slam. Do you find that, that the motivation component of a handicap is a bit less pronounced uh, in, in a grand slam? Yeah, it's, it's, I don't think it's pronounced at all. I mean, you've got to assume that everybody's coming into a grand slam putting their best foot forward. Like the only time, the only time where I would speak about a player not having maximum motivation at a grand slam is when somebody's done it before so many times. And even then, you don't do it so many times by lacking motivation. Like, I spoke about Novak Djokovic in the lead-up to the Aussie Open and thought, you know, how much does he want to fight for another one? And you, you could have said that every time he's won it. Same with Rafael Nadal at the French. So, there's for me, you're at a Grand Slam. There's no... I, I, I have to assume that all of these guys are going to be keen, ready to go, putting their best foot forward. And my analogy for that would be, it's like footy finals in the NRL you don't have a team that's in like kind of a flat spot is there others you talked about watching players go through a tournament so are there certain wins that really impress you and then other wins that are like less impressive and do you also try and uh, factor in players I guess um petrol tank like seeing which matches might have taken it out of them so there could be like an energy advantage in a game prior to prior to a tournament or through no through a tournament now yeah Yeah, game by game like yeah absolutely like there's like Aussie Open, you've got guys finishing up sometimes at 2 or 3 a.m. And like, you've got to take that into consideration. But like something that people do too often, people who try to get too clever with it is like, he finished at 3 a.m. There's no way he's going to be able to back it up. Well, actually, that guy could be running on fumes. He could be playing with his heart on his sleeve. He could be having an ice bath, sleeping eight hours, doing absolutely everything he can. And he could just be riding a hot form. Like, it's all about balance with these different factors. Like, and like you mentioned that there aren't look-ahead spots or maybe not as not, not as often. But they're, they're, I would say there certainly is in tennis because if somebody like Nick Kyrgios, who is fairly immature as far as athletes go, if he knows that he's going to play Rafael Nadal in round four and he's playing, I don't know, anybody, you know, Federico Del Bonis in round three, that he would definitely be thinking, oh, I've got to beat Del Bonas so I can go and play against Rafa. But he'd be thinking less about Del Bonas than what he, you know, he's trying to get somewhere instead of focusing on the particular person at hand. And that comes down to like my perceived 
maturity of a player. Like Rafael Nadal, in my opinion, would never do that. I don't think he would ever, ever do that. He's like the most mentally fixed in professional kind of athlete. He approaches every match the same, or at least appears to. But there are some players who I, I think are vulnerable to look-ahead spots where they've got something big coming up around the corner and they might slip up a little bit. It's, they might not lose, but you know they might not cover the spread, which is the difference between a win and a loss for us. So, so yeah, like there, there's there's massive factors throughout a tournament like that. Um, definitely, yeah. And and it sounds like you even play a little bit psychologist, which I find fascinating too. Yeah, because always. You look at a guy like Kyrgios. Well, the, and I'm not telling this expert, but my gauge of it is like obviously his ceiling. He can beat just about anybody. He can certainly yeah. compete with the best. But yeah. you've got to almost try and guess his mentality of coming in because if you just bet him purely on his ability, you'd be betting him every game. But you'd be yeah. You know, losing plenty of times when he then he'd come out and be disinterested two games in, and you've you've thrown away your money. And imagine like imagine having to make odds for Nick Curios as a as an odds maker because it's impossible. Like, how long's a piece of string? How motivated? The, the thing Nick Curios is the most volatile athlete I've ever watched. I've never seen anybody like him. I've always tried to pick him. I've always tried to figure out when he's gonna you know really sink his teeth into a tournament and do well, and when I wanted to lay him and stuff like that. But you can never. You mean bet against him or? Yeah, sorry, bet against, bet, oh, okay. no, bet against him. Sorry, yeah. Because he's, he's a good looking rooster <laughs> well, like, as well. He's a good looking guy, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that's, yeah. With Nick, mate, it's really tough. If he's playing at the peak of his powers, he can beat or match it with anybody. Not just like guys in the teens or guys in the 20s like Djokovic, Federer and Adal. He can play and beat anybody. But to figure out... Like, I was on Instagram the other night, and Nick Nick was on the red wine and then the Negronis. And that's telling. That's telling. It's not something I'm going to look at and say, hey, everyone, Nick had a red wine at the restaurant last night, bet against him. But like I mentioned with Alex following players on Instagram and seeing what they're up to, I know Instagram only tells a very small story, but it also makes up a very small portion of the approach. Playing psychologist thinking, is he going to be keen? You talked about Kyrgios, right? And uh, this Australian Open is unlike any other. Where it's yes. well publicised. The COVID protocols, these players, obviously their preparation is massively disrupted with, as far as I understand, basically every international player being forced to be quarantined uh, for 14 days and really no access to their normal gym or a tennis court. Do, how do you see this playing into the results in, in the open and do you think that gives a massive advantage to the Aussie players that are just able to train freely? Yeah, I, and I think this is a question that everybody's going to want to ask or search for themselves. Admittedly, I've probably under-researched it, but not to the point where I don't know anything. I, from what I believe, there were three out of the 17 flights that came to Australia that were linked to a positive test. And I think the people that were on or around that flight had to quarantine more strictly than others. From what I know, the majority of the players on the tour had access to tennis courts for four to five hours a day. Now that in the two weeks leading up to a grand slam, for me, that's enough to say they're going to be close to thereabouts. I know it's still a factor. Then for the guys who were like Roberto Batista, one of the guys who came out and had a really big whinge about it. He, I mean, Pablo Cuevas, a guy on Instagram I saw had his mattress up against the wall and was hitting a ball against it. Mm-hmm. Mate, it's, it's a bit of a circus and it's hard, it's hard to, it's hard to determine how much of an impact it's going to have. Like it's why you use these great ocean roads, these Murray rivers that are on right now, these ATP carbs to figure out what kind of fitness level and, and, and I guess how sharp these guys are coming out despite the circumstances they're faced with. They're spending two weeks in their bedroom. They're not spending three months in their bedroom. I, I think that these guys have done the majority of their hard yards before getting on the plane as you would do knowing that you're coming into a bit of a weird situation where you're not going to be able to do as much. And I think that, you know, look, I'm not a, I'm not a tennis trainer, so I don't know. I'm not an expert at this, but I, I don't imagine people are flogging themselves, running sprints up a hill in the two weeks leading up to, I think as long as they get enough, as long as they can swing a racket, as long as they can simulate a match somewhat, they should be okay if not on day one or day two, by the time you get to the, to the rounds three and four and part two, the Aussies, well, none of the Aussies are much good. So I don't really, I'm not like terrified at their high ceiling throughout the tournament and, you know, how much of an advantage they are. But they'd have to be, right? They, like, like they're, they're in the country. They don't have to comply to any of these, these rules. So, yeah, they'd have to be an advantage. It's just, for me, you know, will the odds be a reflection of that? 
Like, will somebody have be you a bit seen shorter? any Aussies futures odds dropping? Like, wouldn't no. this be the year for Kyrgios to win yeah. because he yeah. wouldn't be but, as disrupted as others? Yeah, but Nick took the whole year off last year, so right. he didn't play last year. So it's like it's not the year for Nick. Like, it, 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 I've had people ask me, is he value? He's Australian, and it's like, mate, like, yeah, he's an Aussie, and yeah, he has had freedom to bounce around, practice where he wants, and effectively do a lot more than everybody else. But he didn't play meaningful tennis in 2020. I'm seeing Djokovic right now at $2.20. To me, everything that happened last year, the fact that he was fair, you know, he, he won the great, he, he's the defending champion, okay? He won last year. But for me, there's others in the mix who are over the odds to, to kind of dethrone Novak here at Melbourne. Nadal's not in the picture for me. I can't have anything of Nadal just because... It's been a long time. I, don't, I think he, he last won a hard-court Grand Slam in 2019 US Open. Hasn't done much at the Aussie Open in recent times. And just the older he gets, the less comfortable he looks on the quicker services. Dominic Team is a guy that I, I'm looking at, and I think that he can really shake things up. He made the final last year against Novak, lost in four, but was sensational. Probably the fittest guy on the tour. And being the fittest guy on the tour is a, it has never been more advantageous than right now, I would think. Because... You know, if if you if you are limited in your training, people who are carrying over so much cardiovascular endurance and, and all this stuff, I think are going to be at a bit of an advantage. Dominic Team's a bulldog. He's someone who's always going to stick around in a match. So Dominic Team's someone that I'm marking as the out and out second best shot. And what odds is Team's kind of range? So Team is about six six fifty. I'd probably give him a twenty percent. I think he's about five bucks. So it's look. There's no. I'm not at a slam dunk situation yet. Uh, I'd love to be after the draw comes out. Hopefully I can see something. But with these Grand Slams, the hierarchy has been so set for the last 10 years, it's very hard to pick a time when somebody else is going to win. And then another guy um, another guy who I've actually backed at $21 is Stefano Sitsipas. And I kind of spec him, bet on him a little bit because at $21 at Unibet, it looked way over the odds. He's now $13 at Bet365. But I do think with guy, and you know, what I said at the start of the, of the program is like a guy like Stefano Sitsipas is $21 and then a guy in the same tournament Dominic team is six dollars if those two played each other Sitsipas would not be higher than 250 or 260 so for me that is right off the bat how I can strengthen my own personal case in favor of a player Sitsipas is now firm into the 13 to 14 dollar mark that's fair enough but that's plenty of food for thought on some of the main contenders look as we've referred to your chat with Alex a few times people probably know um if they you know didn't see that chat they can go back and listen to that one for more of your thoughts on breaking down tennis but Alex was of course a tennis gun um himself <laughs> but it's arguable whether Alex's greatest tennis achievements were on the court he once beat Kainer Shikori in a juniors tournament no or, he didn't or on the pod where he gave <laughs> many many Grand Slam double-digit multi-winners. And uh, look, you've kindly said you're going to step up to the plate. You're going to give us your best yeah. daily multis in yeah. the Aussie Open. So I just implore everyone, look for those. I'm guessing Sunday, you'd, you'd probably give out your round one multi. Sure. And I presume sure. they will be at their juiciest in the early days of the yeah. tournament when you've got more matches to choose from. So look, you've got 100%. big boots to 100%. fill, but it's a huge opportunity. Huge. You'll, be, you'll be beloved in the group yeah. if you can get one up for the boys. <laughs> just one. Just one. At the, yeah, just one. And look, no, I'm... I'm bloody keen to do that. And I like the way Alex used to do it. He used to kind of pick five or six, you know, $1, $20, $30 kind of prospects and then grab one guy at 280 who he really thought was overs. And, you know, the finished product, you've got eight or nine bucks or something like that, or even higher with Alex sometimes. So I'll kind of try to follow in those footsteps, maybe go a little bit my own way. Who knows? But I'll certainly do my best on the multi front. And I'm keen to get into that. We trust you, mate. We look forward to those <laughs> ones. So, um, And then, of course, on top of sharing your multis and you do share the odd tip, but you also do share or do handicap tennis as a full-time enterprise. So if there's yeah. people interested more uh, in following everything you do, where should they look for that? I'm on Facebook. You, my, you see my personal profile floating around all the time. Just send me a message and we can speak about how you want to get on board. I guarantee you will get extra messages if you can get one of these big multis up. So oh, that's oh, I think good, I will. Good. It's a, it's a max out. motivation yeah. spot for the players in the Grand Slam, <laughs> and it's max motivation yeah. for yourself. But, but so thanks hard, very though. much. Oh, of course it great. is. You don't have to tell me, mate. <laughs> you don't have to tell me. But I know you'll do your best. You'll give us a shot. Uh, and thanks for taking the time to be on your second uh, appearance on the Wild World of Punting. Yeah, thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. So last week I did a whole main segment called Ask Winnie Anything where I answered all the questions that you guys submitted on an array of subjects and thanks for those and go back and listen if you haven't if you're interested in that. But uh, one of the questions was, if I could start my punting life over, 
what would I do differently? And that was from Brent Creel. And genuinely, thank you, Brent, for that question because it really got me thinking. And that's why I decided this could be worthy of its own little segment this week. So, I mean, obviously, the first thing I'd say is if I'd love to go back to begin my punting life, uh, knowing everything I know now, everything that Alex and I have shared for the last six plus years, you know, I shudder to think of the amount of opportunities there would have been to make money 10 or 15 years ago. And I'm obviously not talking about back to the future almanac style. I just mean, if I could go back in time 10, 15 years and bet in the sharp, you know, manner that we do now with far, far less educated marketplace and sophisticated betting markets, I really think you'd be basically printing money. But that is the nature of punting. It evolves and the marketplace gets sharper. And that's why you've got to always try and find new edges. Um, But to start at the beginning with me, I mean, when I was first placing bets, let's just say I wasn't 18 and it was through a family member and I was no sharper than any other bloke on the street. I might have thought I was, but uh, you know, I'd bet a team to win a comp because I thought that were good. I'd want to bet on my own team. Um, I've always thought I had a decent eye for maybe spotting a diamond in the rough or spotting you know an underrated team from time to time. But as I've said many times over the years, I've certainly learnt a lot during my betting life from mistakes that have been made and many, many square bets I've made along the way. I mean, one story comes to mind. I remember going down the tab before I even had an online account to have a bet on the 20, 2008 uh, NRL Grand Final and I wanted to put 50 bucks on the Storm and they're about a dollar ninety to beat Manly. And in retrospect, you know, you look at that Grand Final and the circumstances and the spot for Manly in that game. I mean, backing Melbourne was the exact opposite line of thinking to what we've ended up preaching and showing a lot of success in the last, you know, six years of the pod. But back then, I just thought defending Premiers, Storm, too good for Manly. So I chucked my 50 bucks on. But if you guys remember, or maybe you still you still do it at some tabs, you had to punch in like a five-digit code. I put the wrong code in. I accidentally put my 50 bucks on Manly. And this is how kind of square I was. I was like, oh, well... Yeah, maybe Manly could win. I guess I'm cheering for Manly. You know, I had no concept of getting value. And then the funny thing is, of course, if you recall, I told Alex about that. We watched the grand final. Manly won 40 nil. And then I remember bragging about how I had 50 bucks on Manly to the boys. And Alex is gone. You shouldn't exactly be bragging about that. Um, but then, you know, a year or two later, I opened up my first online account, which I recall was Sporting Bet. And I remember saying to myself something along the lines of, all right, you're going to deposit this chunk of money in. If it ever runs out, then you're going to stop betting. And I'm sure you can guess how that turned out. My first bet I ever placed online, I also remember, all right, what's on today? And it was an NBA game. Oh, the Miami Heat are playing. They've got Dwayne Wade. He's really good. I'll bet him over 24 and a half points. He should be good for more than 24 points. Uh, nope. Um, and of course... My larger point is, you know, if I could speak to my younger self, it would be, you know, try and really keep the discipline and really look for good value. And overall, I could talk for, you know, hours, obviously, about my whole punting life. But the number one point when I really think about it, which applies to everyone, is just the danger of chasing losses. And as I said, I started my punting with, you know, going to the tab and having one online account and then slowly another and another. And I think I was a, a decent punter who thought I was a great punter back then. And just like any punter, even great punters, like you have your rough spells. And I feel like it always starts with one or two unlucky losses that kind of bother you. And you just want to like shake that feeling of that loss. And then you lose the patience, you lose the discipline. And you don't wait for that next bet that you really love, that you really believe there's value in because you want to kind of win it back straight away. And that's where I would start to look to bet on whatever's next. And You know, it's something that's challenging even to this day. I talk to people about how when I look at an upcoming round of NRL, there's usually like two to three sides that I like. But then somehow you get to Sunday and you're really staring at that Sunday game and you start talking yourself into a bet and you kind of catch yourself. Well, hang on. This game didn't jump out to me during the week. Why is it only, why do I only think it's value now just because it's the next game on? So yeah, I just want to make it clear. Like I wasn't like some sort of betting prodigy out of the gates that the second that I got these accounts like Sporting Bet or Sports Bet where I was, you know, printing money, I, um, I'm sure in fact that those accounts were all started in the red because just like every other punter, I didn't really realize what bets were even value or in my favor. I suppose just because of the weirdo that I am, I mean, I certainly love watching sport and I also got, have always had a bit of an obsession with punting And I'm fortunate that I did learn and I learned to kind of turn things into my favor. 
And, you know, and another thing is, even though I learned the hard way sometimes, I guess when I started punting, I was a uni student and the amounts of money, you know, that I was putting per bet were far smaller too. But um, I did turn the tables on the bookies. And if you guys have listened to the pod for the last six or seven years, you kind of understand how I've been able to be a successful punter. And I've certainly never tried to keep any secrets or hide it, hold anything back. You know, my number one goal doing the pod has always been to grow the amount of people that listen to the pod, the number of people that enjoy it and the people that get stuff out of it. So I don't try and hold back any information. I want to share as much knowledge as I possibly can. So I hope that if you've listened for a number of years or seasons that you've gotten a bit of knowledge to help yourself become a more successful punter. Um, but as I say, I wasn't successful from the very beginning, but if we're talking timeline, I was opening up online accounts 10 to 12 years ago and I have a recollection of like starting to, when I started not knowing at all that they could limit you, restrict you or, you know, uh, cancel your account. But I started to experience that I reckon about eight years ago. Um, and just to, if you're curious, I think Alex was probably along the same timeline where he and I, because we're, you know, we've been mates for a long time, we were sharing information, we shared some wins, we shared some bloody tough losses as well. Um, but we were on a similar level and progression with our punting. And it was probably around, yeah, about 2013, 2014, where we started saying, hang on, what we can't get every bet on that we want, we can't get as much money on the bets that we want and as you guys know because we've said many times that was actually part of the genesis for starting the pod it was like well if we can't get all these tips on ourselves let's share them with our mates and then our mates grew to our audience now you guys are all our mates so um look overall as i said just being able to kind of turn the tables and being able to bet successfully and being starting to you know bet bigger amounts and play into multis with advantage legs. I've certainly been able to be in net profit punting in my lifetime. And that's despite, you know, giving the bookies a little bit head start in my novice years. And also despite despite giving a bit of money back to the bookies in some dry spells where, as I said, you know, I wish myself I could have had more discipline on some losing runs. And I think that's the number one thing I'd like you guys to take away from this. It's like a lot of people really struggle to deal with a losing streak you have a bad month or a bad week, even people don't like to have a bad day or I don't want to be down for this punting session. And when you look back at it, life is one punting session. So that's how you really need to think about it. It's all one session. So if anything, bet bigger when you're on a winning streak and you're seeing the ball well and you've got more profit to play with and bet smaller when you're on a losing streak and things aren't going your way because I think a lot of people do it the other way around. I mean, my old man said, this is really simple advice, but he just said it to me like, only bet what you can afford to lose. And that is really simple, but it's like, basically don't bet money that it would bother you if you lost. Now, if you're sharp, if you're betting in a sharp way and you don't expect to lose, that's great. But I still think for everybody, you should set aside an amount of money that you're comfortable losing. This is money you're putting aside to bet with. If you don't lose at all, it's a bonus. If you break even, well, you got free entertainment. And if you do make money with your punting, well, that's the dream. And that's what we all hope to achieve. So I hope you guys got a little bit out of that, just in terms of your own approach to your own punting. Uh, next, change of gears, Jamie Soward is jumping on to talk NBA, the blockbuster Harden trade to the Nets. Does that make them the team to beat in the NBA? Some other surprises so far this season. We've got a little disagreement, and I love uh, when uh, that Jamie's certainly not afraid to disagree with me, a disagreement about a potential trade that could go down soon, the MVP race, and then Jamie even gives us a bonus Super Bowl prediction and a prop tip. So here's my chat with Jamie Soward. So let's start with the Nets because we actually speculated before Christmas on the potential <laughs> trade of the of James Harden going to the Nets and you voiced some concerns at the time of why it may not work well but now that it has happened we've had a chance to see some early returns do you still hold the same opinion or are you a little bit more bullish on how good this team can be Yeah well, I think now um yeah they're going to be awful defensively you can't give up 149 points to the wizards in regular time and, and be a championship contender in my opinion uh, however you know, we know that when the playoffs come around it slows the game down so you're going to see those three guys dominate whether they have the uh, cohesiveness you know this to me smells of the 2011 Miami Heat where the big three couldn't just work it out that first year and then they went on a tear the next two years. So uh, I can see that happening. Plus, we don't know the temperament of Corey Irving. We don't know how he's going to go throughout the year, whether he's going to get the shits and not turn up the play or all that kind of stuff, COVID. So um, 
I know that everyone will be jumping on the Brooklyn Nets, but I would be waiting until they go through a little bit of a rough patch again uh, and then looking to get maybe that extra 50 or, or 60 cents if they blow out or if they have a couple of bad losses or if someone gets injured for a couple of weeks and then potentially invest. But um, for me, they'll be there in the Eastern Conference Finals, probably playing the Celtics or the, or the Bucks. I think. And then you've got to also throw Philly into the mix, who I think have the best record in the NBA. And you're right, like, it's been a volatile start for the Nets. Like, they haven't blown everybody away. I think I made a joke before Christmas they could beat teams 150 to 145. Actually, their most recent game was 149, 146. Um, from a betting perspective, I think if you want to look to play one of their opponent players to have a career high, you had Colin Sexton, um, Bam Adebayo. It's a good... It's a good time to have your career high or to bet on a player with an alternate points total over because these games are so high scoring. But you're right, like defensively is a problem. One other thing about the Nets, I'd say, I don't think they're finished constructing their roster. I think they still have a move or two to make. Uh, there's whispers of Kevin Love, but really they could do with a defensive uh, stopper in that side. Is there another player or team that's really caught your attention? One one team that has you know, surprised me but has been really, really good has been the Golden State Warriors. I think this is going to be an eighth seed or seventh seed just off the back of Steph Curry. Look, out east, Philadelphia have surprised me. Atlanta Hawks, they're a fun team to watch, but... I'm actually liking what I'm seeing from my Celtics. I'm liking what I'm seeing from Jason Tatum, who had a little bit of a layoff. Uh, Kemba Walker probably needs to, again, you know, be averaging that 20, sort of 5 and 7, or 27 and 5, you know, just being happy with that rather than trying to get the 28, 29. He's got two amazing young talents there, two two way players who can get the job done at both ends. So uh, I'm quite comfortable at the moment with the Celtics. A team that's disappointed, though, Jacob, the Miami Heat. What's it doing? Uh, this is a team that. I know that COVID strikes and injuries and all that kind of stuff, but the way they played yesterday, up 10, you know, with a couple of minutes left, the Charlotte Hornets, not a great team. Uh, they should win that game, and you can see them struggling for the rest of the year. And I know Shaq said they won't make the playoffs. I don't know if it's that serious, but uh, they don't look good at the moment. They look really, really bad. Yeah, the Heat have had a few guys out, and you do wonder if there's that finals hangover. A few other things you mentioned. I mean, you mentioned the Warriors, and they are looking like they can make the playoffs, and we shouldn't talk about Bradley Beal and then not mention the Warriors too because they're in the mix. They could create a package probably around Wiggins, uh, Wiseman perhaps, if they're w willing, and that's a future building block for Washington, which would make it appealing for them. And the case for the Warriors would be we can suddenly have Draymond, Steph, um, Clay, and Bradley Wiseman. Beal. They ain't trading Wiseman. I reckon that the person that's on the trading block for them would be future picks, if they have any, and Draymond Green. I think that they see a future around Wiseman, and Draymond Green isn't the Draymond Green that we saw play three years ago, four years well, ago. I, I agree with those points, but the thing is that if, if the Warriors were to feel like our window is now, whereas Wiseman, I think, is a future all-star, but is his, be is his best seasons, you know, three or four years away, does it, does it align perfectly with the prime of their superstars? But the other guy I want to talk about is Luca. We both liked him. Like, yeah, he was the favourite. But we said $5 is a good value for Luca to win the MVP. It seemed to be his year. He's drifted now. He's out here $8, $9. Now, I think with a short preseason, he came in like unfit, almost like he wanted to play himself into match fitness. And I wanted to ask you, did, did that, is that something that you ever tried to do in, um, in rugby <laughs> league? Like it's a long season. Is there such a thing as players coming into a season underdone saying, I'll play myself into shape and I'll be... I'll be suboptimal in the first month of the year, but I'll gain match fitness through the games. Yeah, I think this is what separates LeBron James from the guys that try to take the best player in the world crown year after year is he is always in shape. Uh, for us, we started in November and you know, I was out of shape most Novembers, but we've got three months to get ready before we actually play. So we are in peak condition, ready to go. Uh, we only have 24 games, so you've got to make sure that every one of those games counts. Um, for me, LeBron James, he will win the MVP this year. We tipped him here uh, at the start of the year on your podcast and on the Sweet and Sour podcast with Tristan. Uh, $10, he's into 380 I love the fact that the storyline's around him. I love the fact that he's still vocal. And in a time that there is no crowds, he still seems to be the most talked about person in the NBA. Every night we're seeing him on Sports Center. You know, he's not tired. He's playing games in 13 days and all that kind of stuff. Whereas you look at Luca who's coming to a season where it's a shortened season. Uh, he's going to play himself into shape where you can't do that if you're knocking off 10 games. And I don't know if his team's as hungry as what they were last year. Great point you made there is his team, we said this at the start of the year, like 
you do need to have one of the best records to be in the MVP discussion generally, unless it's an extreme case where you're clearly dragging a team. And people thought like Dallas should be a top four seed in the West. They currently have a losing record. So that even if Luca plays better, he's not going to be the MVP if Dallas is just over 500 team. I'm glad you brought up LeBron because we should finish with him. And I agree like, and you say we tipped him. I give you the credit. I didn't really think he was going to be going all out in the regular season, but you said $10 odds. And now I, you know, I wish I'd been on that. And to be honest, I think if you can still find around $4 and he has one or two more really massive signature performances, I'd jump on that because we all know LeBron is chasing Michael Jordan. As crazy as that sounds, LeBron has four rings and four MVPs. Jordan had five MVPs, six rings. Like, So if, if LeBron can get his fifth MVP this season and, and he's on the championship favorite as well, it suddenly is bringing that discussion like r- really close together. And I think kind of the point you made, if LeBron can smell it, he won't ease up late in the year. Even if they've got like a seed secured, he will want to slam it at home because it does mean something to him in terms of his legacy. I love the fact that you mentioned the Jordan-LeBron storyline. It carries itself. So uh, when you see a guy doing the things that he does, like the first sentence is, I can't believe he's doing this thing at 37. Like this is unbelievable. We've never seen this before. And we haven't. Uh, so, And this is the year for goats. You look at Tom Brady, what he's doing in the NFL, LeBron James. Super Bowl coming up this Monday. February, I always think of as a quiet sport, but the main sport is really NBA, which is on daily, which is great to chat about today. And then we got footy next month. So how good is that? It's coming up quickly. So as we start to amp up, heading into uh, you know what's going to be an amazing NRL season, keeping it up for short and sour Monday mornings and sweet and sour uh, Tuesday afternoons uh, on the podcast, wherever you get your podcast. I'm sure we'll connect during the footy season as well, but thanks for your time again on the wide world of punting. Tom Brady to win his seventh, the Bucks to win, and if you are looking for a little bit of value, which I know you always are, Jacob, and so are your listeners and, and viewers, Roughing the Passer, that's right. If you can get any Roughing the Passer, it's $2.40, I think, uh, in most sites, but Top Sport have got it about $2.45, a Roughing the Passer during the Super Bowl, a little bit of fun within the game. I love it. A bonus value tip. And that is a very interesting one because they do want to protect the quarterbacks and we've got the goat versus the baby goat. So, yeah, $2.50, $2.40 plus money roughing the passer. I've got a few NFL props that are going to be shared on this pod. So thanks for including yours. Good luck. Enjoy the game. No worries. Cheers. And on that note of Super Bowl prop betting, you guys know Nettie from Nettie Given Sunday and Matt O'Keefe. I had them both on as regular guests on the Wide World of Punting two weeks ago. They share a lot of NFL tips and they've each given me a cameo, less than 60 second tip for the Super Bowl on a prop market. So I'm going to roll them out. It'll be Matt, then Nettie, followed by my chat with Tristan about the week in the life of being a CEO of a major bookie, and he talks Super Bowl better. Here's the Super Bowl cameo picks, followed by Tristan in behind bookie lines. Hey guys, best bet for Super Bowl. We're going longest punt over under 51.5 yards for Tampa Bay punter Brad Pinion. We're going under the 51.5. He's had 17 punts in his last five weeks. He's had two that have gone over this total for 52 and 53 yards. Add to that, we've got a bit of wind and rain forecast for the Super Bowl and the fact that a high-scoring game, I don't think either team is going to want to punt a whole lot in this game. Best bet, under 51.5 punting yards, Brad Pinion. You can find this on points bet at $1.87. Keep your eyes out for markets on other bookies as they come out later in the week. Ow! Netty Given Sunday, 60 seconds or less edition. We are back. Jacob's asked me to put together a prop for the Super Bowl. I got one for you. Go into Unibet. Go under the penalties market. First penalty accepted. Let's go with false start. It's paying $5. I think the next best one out there is $2.40 something. But we're going with 5 bucks. With this penalty, there is nowhere to hide in the Super Bowl. Usually the referees let the boys play. With this one, no hiding. It's right there in front of everyone. You've also got two teams that are not used to playing in front of fans this season. Jitters, a couple of people playing out of position. False start seems good. There it is, 40 seconds. I'm going to go have sex, come back. It'll still be under 60. Peace. I don't know if this is going to be the typical life week in the life for every director of a bookmaker, but you can share you know, some of the tasks and um, responsibilities that you deal with on a weekly basis. So we're, we're a lot different to, um, obviously, most of the bigger operators where our business has grown from you know, a two-man band, Dad and myself, to steadily we've got 25 or 30 of the crew that, that trade and do different roles in top sports. So... You know, I probably try to 
be a little bit more hands on than potentially a few of um, you know your other CEOs and those sort of things around the traps. You know, I love nothing more than getting involved and trading some races or trading some sporting events and these sort of things. But there's a lot of other jobs that well, that that occur throughout the um, throughout the course of betting, and one of those isn't sort of keeping the uh, camera filming me correctly. <laughs> I'm not very good at that. But um, no, we 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 uh, like there's just so many things that go into a week, and it's it's sort of dealing with relationships, looking at you know dealing with a lot of IT things, um, you know, making sure we've we've got a good structure of events, making sure we've got a firm plan with all our rostering, and it's just trying to manage all of the different people in our group. Um, you know, yesterday was a different example from a from a normal week to week where when, when we, we have a little policy in, in in top sport where if we have a strong month we'll go and do it doing an event as a group um so yesterday we all went on a um on, on a little pub crawl around the around mount tambourine which was a bit of fun so i think things like that are just as, as vital to spend time with the group and and you know socially as well to to make sure that um you know everyone's on the same page and that's probably my biggest role is just to manage people as as well as i can to get the best out of everyone make sure everyone's really excited about coming to work at top sport I, I, my, my sort of attitude is that i don't want any one of the crew to do something that i'm not comfortable doing myself um and i, I generally try to do a lot of those hands-on sort of you know tasks that aren't a lot of fun that, that that's something that i try to pride myself on on doing those things you know from a, a day-to-day basis if you look through our week uh monday is generally just trying to tidy up some loose ends over the weekend so you spend a lot of time going through what happened I, like Saturday's our biggest day by a long way and you know I'll, I'll generally click myself an email 10 or 15 times throughout a day on Saturday and, and then look to tidy up all these sort of jobs Tuesday sort of that little bit of a, a quieter day there isn't as much happening so I'm trying to sort of get a lot of the things behind the scenes um, into play then Wednesday's our, our really big day um, in terms of getting ready for the weekend like that's where all of our like the, the footy markets tend to come out a little bit earlier now, but Wednesday is probably the day when you've, you've just had your team list for NRL. Um, you know, you've, you, you're bringing your totals out and all these sort of things. So it's just making sure we've got everyone in a position. So I'm, I'm overseeing a little bit of that. I'm, I'm working on things in the background, making sure our prices are up, you know, in, in the manner we want to have them for, for Saturday's racing as well. So, um, and then Thursday is, is probably, um, you know, just, just, making sure we've got everything ready for the weekend, dealing with anything we need to do if, if we need to release something to the site. You know, communi- I, I spent a lot of time communicating with the IT team, just trying to uh, make sure we've got everything ready to go. And then once you get Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it's just all full-on trading. You know, I'm, I'm in there trading on a Saturday, making sure that I, I, I don't handle a lot of meetings, but I, I'm, I'm in there listening to the to the bets that are coming in, giving my input when I feel it, it's it's necessary, if there's a big bet or there's a bit of uncertainty on the way we handle it, then I try to, you know, put my opinion forward so the guys have an understanding of, of, of what they want to do. It always back them. If, if they have a strong opinion on something, I'm not going to override it. But it, it just gives you that little bit of security that if, if it is a 50-50 call, you know, you, you can chime in with your sort of um, feedback. Well, it definitely highlights how busy you are and that it's a 20, 24-7 kind of role because you guys are taking bets 24-7. So then when is your when do you have a day off? Do you, when, is, when is your weekend? Because I imagine it wouldn't be a typical weekend with how busy that is with all the events taking place. Yeah, so it depends a little bit on, um, on, on the season. So outside footy season, I'll, I'll always take Sunday off and I'll, you know, particularly now I've got a couple of little girls, so they go to school and, um, and, and you know, it gives me the opportunity to spend time with them on a Sunday. Most of the other days I'm, I'm, I'm working when it gets to footy season. We've got a pretty good group of guys in there now that can really handle the, the day-to-day footy on a Sunday, so I still try to take that off, but I'll, I, I, I love watching games as well. So, you know, like that, that will be a little bit different. We'll, we'll go somewhere as a family unit and, and you know, have, a, have a bit of downtime, but we'll still be watching the, uh, the footy and, you know, the guys can get onto me at any time if they need to ask a question. So, yeah, my, my weekend is generally Sunday. Saturday, there is uh, there's definitely no rest. It's it's a it's a big day. My my Saturday, I normally get in at about you know six and work through till nine or ten in the evening. It's just one of those days where you just want to you know want 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 to have all hands on deck and um and 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 do the best you can. And then during the week, it's just yeah, when the girls are at school, um you know you, I, I just try to chip away and do as many things as I can. All the rest of the guys, they um they work their three or four day rosters where we we sort of do have longer hours just so that they can get an extra day off. So. That seems to work well from our end as well. That's kind of one of the perks of your job, and I can relate to that as well. In that, um, 
you can't get too much grief from the missus for watching sport because watching <laughs> sport is still part of like part of your important job as well. And one of the cool things about this series and having you on each week is you have talked about a lot of the challenges that you have faced and the, the disputes you have with customers or how you try and avoid any, you know, any disputes or, or avoid difficult situations. So that's been awesome kind of talking through. I also heard you say about having a strong month last month, which could be a little jab at the why world better the week. <laughs> only one salute in the last seven weeks or something, but we're going to hopefully get up this week and I'm going to get creative with a Super Bowl based Why World Better the Week, which I'll share later in the pod. So I want to talk to you about the Super Bowl taking place on Monday, Australian time Sunday in the States. Um, because of my, my perspective is that it has really grown in attention and popularity in Australia. Is that something that you've noticed like reflected in the weight of money that you've taken on this event over the years? Oh, for sure. Like, especially just in the last couple of years as we've grown a bit of, as a brand, like it's always been a really big uh, betting game for us on your, you know, your main three markets, your win line and totals with always more exotic type markets, um, you know, th- th- than a normal game. But as we've sort of not, not shifted from away from our professional type punters, but we've just got more and more customers that has really, really, really grown. Um, and, and, and the different thing with the Super Bowl, and it's like in any grand final, in, in any sport that you, you deal with, you've got to be able to also match up your your Super Bowl outright book with the the individual game itself. Um, so, for example, we've got an ugly position at the moment with with Kansas. Um, we don't have much of a bit, much of a better position with Tampa either, to be honest. Like we're in a position where we're going to lose on whichever whichever side wins on that part of it. So on some occasions. We've had a position where we've got a really heavy liability on one side and a really good result on another side. And then you've got to say, okay, well, am I going to try to balance that up? Am I going to try to go again and say, well, we're in an awkward spot here. We're just going to get going. And and it all depends on the pricing and that, which I know I've I've read a few of your things over the last week. It's sort of how you, you know, recommend hedges and those sort of things. And there's no difference from our point of view. There's no one perfect strategy in that regard. You've got to look at the game in isolation and say, well, this is how we want to do it and, and, and there's no real difference from bookmaking or, or punting and that side of it. So that, that's one of the differences with Super Bowl. If you've got a really, really bad result, if Kansas City wins a Super Bowl, what you would more than likely do would be to inflate your odds, although you said it's not a great result for the Bucks. But if, you know, if, if relatively you'd rather... Yep. The Bucks, you'd rather the Bucks win. You may inflate the odds on the Bucks because you don't really want any more additional huge head-to-head money on Kansas City that just adds to the money you're already paying out on all those futures. So that's where you you actually factor into your head-to-head odds based on your position, based on the futures money. And, and a really popular episode that we had was about seven or eight episodes ago, you talked about million dollar payouts. And I recall you you had a bloke who won over a million bucks on Kansas City last Super Bowl. And you did mention that he'd filled up again. And I'm sure he had probably a very nice size um, bet that's probably still riding right now. Yeah, exactly. And, and that, that's the thing. And you have to make that decision at that point. And, and probably the, and, and that's where we have a lot of pro punters. So if we get aggressive on on Tampa then we are going to get a lot of those people that are looking for top odds a lot like every punter should you should be trying to find the best odds when you're going to have a bet and they we will get a massive influx of money now we'll still get our regulars that want to be on Kansas but we're just trying to balance things up a little bit now the awkward part of it is when you've got a position like in this game where we're standing Kansas for a significant amount we sort of have then got to try to almost protect against the plus betting because we can mm. obviously get, get jammed both ways then. So that's when you might say, okay, well, in this scenario, I'm already committed to Kansas. What's my preference here? Am, do I prefer to have a real ugly book where I've got a split of one to three, which is just a torturous result? Or do I say, well, you know, I, 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 do our traders sort of think Tampa's uh, you know, value or whatever the scenario might be? And we might then say, well, we're going to try to push the minus. So we want, we, we're either going to put ourselves in a deeper hole or we're going to give, give ourselves a chance to win. And probably being... A more old-fashioned bookie. I'm, I sort of go down with the ship a bit, probably a little bit too much. I'm of I, them of the mentality. Well, we were happy with that book when we took those bets. Uh, now we're in, in a in a playoff. You know, you, is is it a situation where we'll, we'll say we'll go again and we'll lay the minus, and and if Kansas cover, then you know you, you, you get done both ways. But I would rather be supporting a team to to get a result one way or the other. So. But again, it comes down to the situation. It comes down to what we perceive the value of the game could be. Yeah, it is fascinating that all the things that you've got to consider it's, it goes beyond just who you think is going to win the game. And I wasn't meaning to be rude. I grabbed my phone to pull up the odds um, on Top Sport for the Super Bowl because I noticed actually 
when I looked uh, a week ago, you ha- you'd open Tampa Bay plus three and a half, but as you said, you don't really want a lot of people betting Tampa Bay plus three and a half because of that nightmare scenario where the Chiefs win the Super Bowl by three or, you know, yeah. one or two as well. And you're paying out all the Chiefs head-to-head, all the Chiefs Super Bowl futures, but you're also paying out that Tampa Bay plus three and a half. So as I look now, the Chiefs are a minus three favorite. But of course, the other fascinating thing about the Super Bowl is it's got like more markets than just about any other standalone, you know, team sporting event. And that's probably something that you've seen a demand for increase. So can you talk to us about all the kind of crazy props that you've got available for the game? Yeah, well, I'm just looking at the site now. We've got 240 mm. markets on the main site. We also have a massive range of player bets which aren't in that group. So we'd, we'd have probably close to 1,000 markets up on the game where if you had have looked at us maybe 10 years ago when we were in the early stages, we probably had 20 markets up and we thought we had a big range up compared to what we used to do. That And, and obviously the industry's changed, but... Yeah, it's 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 a it's been a lot of work. There's been the guys have been uh, and and Tish, my sister, she's been spending a lot of time getting all these markets up over the last week. And you look at the quarterback markets, the novelty ones, and and um and you know like the things like the Gatorade color, these sort of things, the length of which the ties end. into what we talked about last week. Um, is kind of people. Some people know what color the Gatorade is, mm. and that's one of those weird ones where if there's a weight of money, you often wonder if that's you know if that's somebody who's got inside information. It's not like a quarterback yards that hasn't, you know, taken place yet. Yeah, and, and that's it. So we we basically have internal notes on what sort of limits, what 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 quality of the um the event we would feel this is. So we sort of give each each event a, a rating and, and that's sort of what we use to to determine like obviously we're not gonna bet as big a number on the novelty market to, you know, Brady over and under yards thrown or those sort of things. So um all that goes into it. You have to and, and we've sort of shifted in how we operate where we know we have to provide these markets now for a content-based thing, but and also the professionals, I think they understand that you know these sort of things are novelty markets. You know that they're not going to get on anywhere near as much on those things as 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 your main markets. But there's a lot into it. There's a lot of um a lot of work that goes into price them up and to monitor it and to monitor any team changes. I know there was a quite a big shift in one of the rushing yards markets which we put up earlier um, in the week. Darrell Williams is has gone from 40 and a half into uh, 28 and a half. So that's quite a significant shift there. Um, you know, and no doubt that's directly related to injury news about the starter, Edwards Hilaire. That, that, that's an interesting one, that news comes out about one player that directly impacts what like what a total over-under should be for another player. Yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. And, and that, that, that's the thing. You've just got to be monitoring that sort of stuff all the time. Yeah, but no, I can't wait for the Super Bowl. It's going to be great. I'm sure plenty of punters are, are thinking the same. And, and yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a big event. Yeah, it's a phenomenal betting event, like you said, because it goes for like four hours, but you can have that. You can have bets that result before the match, like you mentioned, length of the national anthem. You can bet on, obviously, a lot of things involving the halftime show. You can bet on events within a quarter. So there's so many like little games within a game to bet on, and that's a challenge for you, and that's a challenge for punters to try and dive in and find the value. So good luck to the boys, Matt and Nettie, who shared their quick tips for the Super Bowl uh, prior to my chat with Tristan. And now it's time for the Wild World Bet of the Week, which is going to be involving the Super Bowl. But before that, let's address the fact that it was another loss last week after we won the week before. Last week was our English Premier League soccer bet. We needed Arsenal to get a draw or a win against Man United. They did get a draw, but Arsenal also had to score for the bet to salute. And it was a bloody nil-all draw. And that's what you get for betting on soccer. So we move on. Oh, I should say their overall results. Now five wins, eight losses from the 13 bets. ROI of 105%. It's close to treading water, but if you want to look at it this way, if you had 100 bucks on every single one of the Y World bets of the week, you at 105 ROI, in other words, average $5 profit per week over the season, you're up about $65. So... I guess it's better than a kick in the teeth. And what I try to do, while I can't influence the result, of course I try to create a market that is interesting and is fun to cheer for. And I think I've got one for us for the Super Bowl. This is going to be a little bit different, so bear with me. I'm calling it Super Bowl Bingo, and I'm coming up with five different events or props for the Super Bowl. But for us to cash at $2.25 odds, we just need three so three or more of these five to win, we win our money. So basically listen to the five. If you think more are going to win than lose, 
you might like this bet. If you don't like the sound of them, you're not going to jump on. Simple as that. The first one, first field goal made by the Chiefs. It's pretty much a 50-50. It's going to be a close Super Bowl. It's very hard to, you know, I can't say with a great degree of confidence like who's going to kick the first field goal, but I do think the Chiefs are justifiably the favorite, the better team. They're also the favorites to kick more field goals in the game, so I can't quite understand why they're priced at purely 50-50 to kick the first field goal. Bucks have a stout defense, and when you're the favorite, I also think you may actually play less risky. Therefore, I like the Chiefs. I also think they've got the better field goal kicker, top it all off. So, I think first field goal will be made by the Kansas City Chiefs. Second prop is the game to be tied at any point after the first score. So obviously nil, nil is how the game starts, as you all know. That doesn't count. But any point after that, will the scores be tied again? So do we get to 3-3? Do we get 6-6, 7-7, anything? But what I love about this tip is if you think the game should be close, it's just something we can cheer the entire game. No matter what the score is, we can always cheer for the team behind to level things up. So I think, and that alone I think is a slight favorite, and I think that one will come through. Either team to attempt a two-point conversion. The more touchdowns there are, the more chances there are that a team will elect to go for two. This Super Bowl has quite a high total. I think last time I checked, it's around 56 points over under. Therefore, there's more touchdowns expected. And teams do go for two. I think the stats are in the last 11 Super Bowls, eight teams have gone for two. Next one, either team to convert a fourth down. Now, this one, I believe, is our lock out of the five. So I'm looking at this one to cash, and then we only have to go two and two on the others. So all they have to do is pick up a first down on fourth down. And what I where I think we get value in this is just the natural progression of the NFL. More and more teams go for it on fourth down. I think we know Brady is the master of the quarterback sneak. We know that Kansas City are super ballsy going for it fourth down even when they had their backup QB in. So anytime we get super short yardage, they could even be inside their own half. Teams will go for it on fourth down. When they're near midfield, I think teams aren't, are going to be reluctant to punt. So that even if it's a fourth and medium, you could see fourth down attempts. And certainly when they're in the red zone, they're going to be thinking we need to score sevens, not threes. Teams could be aggressive either to convert a fourth down to keep a drive alive in the red zone or on the goal line where it's a free three points or you go for the seven. We've seen teams got criticized last week or two weeks ago taking the three when they should have gone for seven. So I think there's several scenarios where we just need one fourth down. Another one is a team that's um, behind late in the game and has no choice. Obviously, isn't going to punt. They're going to be going for it. So I think we're guaranteed to have lots of or to have some fourth down attempts and highly likely to have a fourth down conversion. And the last one is largest lead in the match under 16 and a half points. And what this means is no team can ever be up by 17 or more. And this might feel a bit square because it seems a bit too logical. And the truth is that teams do get out by 17 or more quite frequently. But it just ties back into the fact that I think this will be quite a close game. I feel under 16 and a half points is a big lead, I think. Unless you expect either of these teams to blow out the opposition, that you probably t t lean towards the largest lead never exceeding to convert uh, two touchdowns and then some. So under 16 and a half for the largest lead. So we just need any three of them to win. And obviously a four or all five salute, we're home as well. I think it gives us great fun with a number of events that we can cheer on through the big event, which is the Super Bowl. You're wondering, how do we know if this is value? Well, earlier in this podcast, I talked to Jake Humphreys about whether he does any simulations, any statistical models in Excel for his tennis tips. That is exactly what I applied on Excel to check the value of this bet. So I put in my estimated probability for each of these five uh, props based basically on what the current odds are. And then I ran it, you know, thousands of times. And basically this is coming out in our favor about 60% of the time. And I'm happy to explain a bit further if anyone's interested in how you can run that exercise yourself, even if you were to tweak the percentages, likelihoods of these um, individual props yourself. I think you'll find this definitely comes in our favor more than half the time. And that's why I like getting it at $2.25. And so hopefully I've created a fun bet that gives you guys confidence that you want to get on. You can have up to 200 bucks with on that on top sport. It's under gridiron tripod wide world bet of the week. And if you haven't joined top sport yet, you can with the promo code tripod. 
And that will do it, guys. So I'll be back on Saturday with a short Super Bowl preview. I'm not giving everything away today in terms of exactly how I think the game will play out. But I've given you guys some props to give you guys some indication. But I'll talk a little bit more about the game overall, the side, the total, and futures and, and, and hedging opportunities for those that jumped on my early well, preseason tip of Kansas City at $8.50. That will all be on Saturday. But as always, thanks for tuning in to the wide world of punting. And please gamble responsibly. Lego.